information. This session is titled The Scope and Scale of Post Harvest Loss Problem and we session. hope to learn from the experiences from India and Bangladesh. As the session chair for this session, <coughs> may I invite Dr. P.K. Joshi to lead the session. He is the former senior advisor and director for South, IFPRI South Asia office. Prior to his tenure at IFPRI, Dr. Joshi has served as director of the National Academy of Agricultural Research Management in Hyderabad and the director of the National Center for Agricultural Economics and Policy Research. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, Indian Society of Agricultural Economics, the Indian Society of Agricultural Engineering and the Indian so International Society of Noni Research. Dr. P.K. Joshi, thank you very much for joining us today. We have presentations in this session, so I will hand it over to you to lead the rest of the session. Just a small note here uh, for our presenters, you have 10 minutes to make your presentation and uh, my colleague Ruchi here is keeping the time, so we hope you try and restrict yourself to 10 minutes. Good morning, very distinguished delegates from uh, India, Bangladesh, and University of Illinois. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of, I was part of IFRI earlier, so I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of IFRI as well. So my compliments to IFRI, especially Dr. Shahid, for uh, organizing such an important uh, forum, policy forum. I think this is the first uh, time IFRI is organizing on the scope of this uh, securing harvest. Uh, friends, uh, although the chairperson has, uh, not, no, no time has been given to chairperson, but I would like to flag uh, five issues for this particular session. This is a comparison between India and uh, Bangladesh, especially on scope and scale of the uh, post-harvest losses. We have an excellent presentation in the uh, inaugural session by Dr. Ashok Gulati and Dr. Nam Kumar. They are real experiences, they are stalwarts in their own uh, fields, and we were benefited views from their wisdom. So I am flagging five issues and requesting our delegates to kindly go, you know, deliver, deliberate on those. Number one major challenge is the extent of losses. This is a big challenge uh, for everyone. There are large variation in numbers on uh, losses, uh, some say that there are 30% losses, 40% losses, 10% losses, there is no number, exact number, what is the loss? And what is the exact methodology for quantifying those losses? Uh, I was wondering, I read one article, it was published from FAO, it says that 40% losses in India equivalent to the how much, uh, uh, you know, the UK is consumed. So this is a huge number, uh, if we can reduce this loss, I think we can feed millions of poor people who are living in vulnerable areas. Losses will vary from crop to crop and the strategies will also be uh, varying. Second issue is where are the holes in the whole value chain after the post harvest till it reaches to consumers, where are the holes and how to minimize those, those holes. The third is on how to minimize these losses. So one is the technological solutions and the various kinds of technologies are available, but what are the problems? The second is the infrastructure. And fourth uh, issue which I would like to flag that what institutional arrangements and policies can be, can attract private sector. And the research question is that why private sector is not coming forward? What are the constraints? Are the financial constraints there? Or the scale is a problem? Or government policy, storage versus hoarding? Is this is, is, a, is a big problem. There's uncertainty among among these private sector that if we store, it may tomorrow it may be considered to be hoarding. So storage versus hoarding is another issue. How to resolve this issue and how to make the uh, whether technologies or infrastructure or institutions how to make it more inclusive. How to involve small holder in the process of reducing uh, losses. So with this brief background, I would like to invite our uh, four panelists. We have Dr. Prasant Kalita. He is Professor of Agricultural and Biological Engineering, a Presidential Fellow at the University of Illinois and a Fellow of American Society of Agricultural 
Biological Engineering and also Fellow of Indian Society of Agriculture Engineering. He is Editor-in-Chief and Associate Editor with several of the journals. May I request Dr. Prasanta to come and take your seat. I would like to invite Dr. Sarawar Mahmood, the Director General of Bangladesh Ministry of Food. Uh, he joined several positions in the government. He joined the government department in 1991 as Assistant Secretary. Important one is that before joining as Director General of Food, <coughs> Dr. Mahmood worked as Director General in Anti-Corruption Commission, Bangladesh. May I invite you, Dr. Mahmood. I would like to invite Dr. Anil Kumar Jha. He is Deputy Director of Bihar Ministry of Agriculture, Government of uh, Bihar. Uh, Dr. Jha joined Bihar Agricultural Service in 1990 and has served as the various levels, block level, district level, and headquarter level. He was actively involved in preparing the roadmap of agriculture of uh, Government of Bihar and now he is also given the responsibility of implementing roadmap of Bihar. And I am very happy to share with you that a lot of you know, post harvest losses are being given in uh, roadmap of Bihar. Uh, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. R.K. Singh who is the Director of uh, Indian Council of Agriculture Research with the Central Institute of Post Harvest Engineering and uh, Technology. Dr. Singh uh, did his PhD from IIT Kharagpur and he is recipient of several uh, prestigious awards and he was also credited with various kinds of technologies for commercialization and there are few technologies he has patented. Uh, Dr. Singh, please. So now we start uh, as Kartika mentioned that we have uh, 10 minutes. Is someone showing, is there someone uh, showing the time? So please follow uh, the, ah, okay, Ruchi is showing. So please see some time, otherwise many times people see that direction. So see to Ruchi also. Uh, so Dr. Prasad, please. And if you have any question or any con uh, suggestion to make or comment, please hold on, write down, we will do it at the end. Good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you for the organizers and all the distinguished uh, <coughs> participants for this. Let me take one extra minute than 10 minutes, if you allow me. Uh, and in this one minute, I, I want to do something different. I just want everyone to close your eyes. Please do that and think about a hunger-free world. What would that look like to you? Think about all the children. They are getting all the food that they need, all the nutritious food that they, they need for their, their growth. Healthy society, good health, good brain, and prospective citizens of not South Asia, Southeast Asia, for the whole world. Think about the mothers, the happy ones, you know, no longer struggling to feed their children anymore. Think about that world. Now open your eyes. Now come back to reality. Now think where we are today and where, how far we are from that imagination that you just had in your mind. Would not it be nice? We all here, you know, basic thing is we all are here to make that a reality. We all want to get there. Right? So we, we want abandoned food, nutritious food, healthy food, and our, uh, the good people and prosperity of our planet. That's all we want. So my talk will, will give you a status of where we are in terms of only, you know, in the post service losses, that's what my colleague, Dr. Winter Nelson, asked me to talk about. So we'll start with that one. You know, I'm not good with the technology. Let's see if I can, if I can do this. Uh, okay. I think my the former panelists they already talked about. Here's the status right now. We have 
you know, about 7.5 billion people, and very soon we are going to get there. Everybody knows, I'm sure, and I don't want to uh, emphasize too much. Here is the graph that looks like the population growth right now. We are somewhere around here. And look at that blood is just mentioned. Most of the population growth is going to happen in Africa and in some part of Asia right here. Today, even with 7.5 billion people, one out of every eight of us go to bed hungry. So about 840 million, 850 million people hungry today. And so what is going to happen if our food production and distribution stays at the same rate that we have today? By 2050, we'll have another 2 billion people coming into the planet. So, you know, the experts tell us that we need to produce 67 to 70 percent more food out there. How do we produce more food? We already have exhausted most of our resources. Look at that, you know, our land area, our agricultural production. We have, we have some opportunity there. We, our, our people are working on, on developing high yielding crop variety, and we, we, we made a lot of progress there. Also, you know, in a lot of you know, GMO or other type of crops out there. So there have been progress made to increase production. But the challenge is, we all know, especially in India, in this part of the world, you know, the water resources, what's happening? And I'm a water guy, basically. That's what I work all over the world, water and sustainability. We don't have enough water. If you look at that, 70% of the world's available water goes into food production. Other 30% is distributed for industrial and domestic uses. But when we have another 2 billion people are coming, the industries will need more water. The home owners will need more water. And to produce 70% more food, we need more water. Water is a fixed quantity. You know, where do we get that? So water is our big, big constraint there. We also, rapid urbanization is happening. Lots of agricultural land is being lost everywhere. You know, I see that in India. I'm from a village in Assam. I was born. I see that. Lots of agricultural land is being lost. And other, you know, energy type of crops are being grown in terms of in, 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 instead of, of food crops and climate change that is happening you know whether predictions and, and instability droughts and flooding and all those kind of things so considering that you know there is no one silver bullet that we will be able to produce the 70 percent more food to feed the world so i think there are opportunities to learn lots of lots of different things and one of the thing is Preventing or I would say eliminating post harvest loss and waste. I would call food loss and waste. Right now, and you know, and of course there isn't enough data for India yet, and like Dr. Gladi mentioned, you know, ICR and reports show about five percent or so, but FAO says globally we lose about one third of the food production. Now, if you know how much one person in their lifetime consumes food. You, that one year of lost, which is you know more than one billion tons of food, you can feed 37 million people for the rest of their lives with only one eight years of savings, right? And, the, and in terms of food loss, you know, here are some pictures, and I think this picture comes from Bangladesh, and uh, uh, my colleagues are here, they will later on share some of the work. So, you know, we, we lose food, our, our post harvest loss and in terms of weight loss, quality loss, nutritional loss, and seed viability loss. And if you put that in terms of, you know, total hectares, about 200 million hectares is produced, is used to produce the food that we lose, and that is equivalent to about the size of the whole country of Mexico. So, uh, the post-harvest losses contribute in, in several different ways, and in negative ways. Of course, we reduce the food in food uh, availability, so our, we contribute to food insecurity. Uh, farmers' income is significantly reduced, and we have, we we do lots of you know greenhouse gas emission happen from this wasted food that you do processing and other things. About 3.3 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions that happen. So if you think about you know the constant, what it needs for us, what it will take us to grow more food to feed the 
feed the people, and what we have already, if we can totally eliminate or reduce, slowly make some progress, I think it's, it's a lot viable option uh, to, to go for, reduce food loss and food prevention. So here, uh, this is, uh, again, you know, this uh, FAO data shows that if you put all the energy in terms of the total kilocalorie, 53% of the, the based on the calories you count in cereals comprise the largest share of the global food loss and waste is cereal. And then you have all the other things, you know, fruits and tubers, fruits and vegetables, has been mentioned fruits and vegetables as I have 60 to 70% out there. Something close to the, the country here, and if you look at major rice producing countries here, this is China, India right here, Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, and so on and so forth. This gives you in as high as about 25%, yeah, 25% losses out there. Post-harvest loss is a very complex problem. Within India, if you look at that, you know, from, from state to state, the losses are different. And the losses in every, every different type of your, your of the process, you know, your harvesting, uh, threshing, cleaning, storage, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the same, same crop, black ground losses in two different states in India, from Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh, uh, are, are different. And the, the losses within, let's say the harvesting losses are different, drying losses are different, storage losses are different, and so on and so forth. This picture is just got it in a very new, and it came in this journal. I don't know the authenticity of this Outlook uh, <coughs> journal, and it talked about it. it, it Last year, 2019, uh, uh, lots of crop were damaged in Bihar, uh, and they say among all the losses, 86% of the losses happened in Bihar and next in, 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 in Punjab. In Bangladesh, if you look at the gain, you know, your rice, wheat, and maize losses, these are the total number of losses. The thing that I want you to see that mostly the storage and drying losses, that are, those are two the most prevalent processes that, that losses happen. Uh, we, we work on, and I'm not going to talk about that, various different factors and all. See, this, this you know, presentation will be there for, with you. So look at, you know, basically what happens when you get storage losses, and as a result, what happened. So we, we did some of the work here. Before I finish, I want to give you a little bit of the global, you know, what happens in the other part, other part of the world, you know, Food loss and food waste across the globe is same about 30%. In developed countries, a lot of waste happen, a lot of food waste happen. So if you look at that, you know, it's all about there. In developing countries, we have more losses. In developed countries, more waste, that's right. This is in the US. Uh, we, we just worked on, on the Council of Scientific Research uh, issue paper here in the US. And from dairy, vegetable, grain, and everything else. Lots of losses, both retail and, and, and consumer losses. Look at the economic value. Total food loss in the US is about $162 billion. And out of that, about $47 billion in retail and about $115 billion in consumer loss. Energy that goes into that loss only in the US is about, you know, 25% of the total energy consumption in the entire farm for food system is goes that goes into the waste, which is 2% of the all-purpose energy used in the US. Think about that. Here is someone else in the cast issue paper. They say all the other fertilizers and water and everything else, the land, that is lost in only the US food and waste system, in about half of all the national uh, park system, you know, the, the, the food waste and loss is approximately if you, if you put it in the perspective, half of the total area of the national park system. But 3.9 million tons of fertilizer and nutrients that consumer level, it's about 150% about of the total annual fertilizer used in the entire sub-Saharan Africa. The 17 billion cubic meter of irrigation water that goes into this wasted food waste, if you put 50 meter of water in the entire city of Philadelphia, that's what it is. You can do those calculations here for, for Delhi or other cities here. That way, you know, people will, will get a perspective of understanding. So, you know, in 2017, there is a big issue now, as you mentioned, everywhere, both 
food loss and food waste. There are many different organizations working on. We talked to about 78,000 people in, in New York City in 2017. And it, here is a quote that I think, I think from my talk, they put it there. We have to be mindful and intentional to think of not wasting our food, both, you know, both food loss and food waste. And you know, just saying isn't going to happen. Technology, and, and I think my previous panelists said already, technology itself is not going to do that. Policy itself is not going to do that. We have to have an intention of reducing food loss and food waste. So thank you so much, and, and we'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you, during the discussion time. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Sarwar Mahmood uh, from Bangladesh to kindly of present his presentation. He is uh, presenting on impact of post-harvest losses on food security and perspective from Bangladesh. Sir. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am Sarah Mahmood, Director General of Food of Government of Bangladesh. It's really a privilege and pleasure for me to stand before you. I'm not an expert like you, but I'm a journalist. So I would like to express my uh, ideas and in a different way, in general way. You know, the is did you, you have the uh, is did you 12 point three where there is a target that we have to half the uh, loss post harvest loss the, for our own consumption and these targets were <laughs> set by the world uh, body uh, and. These are the from figures you know all this. For Bangladesh, it's though it's a, uh, one study shows that the loss of different food items. Here I would like to say the background. In the 1970s, Bangladesh has a population of seven, uh, 75 million. 75 million. Now it is stands around 60, 160 plus, and it's approaching 170 million. At that time, Bangladesh was not able to feed uh, from its own production to all the citizens. Now Bangladesh has the capacity to feed uh, the whole population. There is a development. The food production has uh, not only doubled; it has three times than before. The cropping intensity has increased around 200 percent. But we have some challenges at the same time. Because if you consider the generation after generation, the food taking culture is changing. In the 70s and 80s, we are consuming cereals. Our generation, we are Cereals plus other food items like uh, fruits, vegetables, and things. And the next generation, they have their own uh, choice. So that after generation after generation, the choice, the culture, and is uh, changing. As the globalization the, uh, is going on, the Bangladesh is also facing some global challenges. Our generation is now more prone to the world, uh, other things. So we have to think about the, not only we want to focus on food grain, but we are now considering that the food uh, cereals are not enough to feed or to satisfy the demand of the future generation. These are some losses, post-harvest losses of different uh, Items. Uh, 
Uh, if you has identified research studies regarding post harvest losses, some public initiatives geared to reduce post harvest losses are already in progress. For example, modern food storage facilities project. Bangladesh has uh, taken some projects uh, to improve the food <coughs> storage capacity and also to reduce the losses, not in terms of the quantity, but also in terms of the nutritional aspect we are considering now. Uh, and also the environmental aspect. Bangladesh, uh, government of Bangladesh is uh, every year procuring cereals like paddy, rice, wheat. These are all the procurement uh, food items. Uh, Bangladesh government is the, the, our, our Ministry of Food and the Directorate of Food procuring almost uh, two million, more than two million tons of food grain from directly from the uh, farmers or the uh, millers. This year there is a change in the, you know, there's a three seasons are there, the Amon, Boro and Aush. In the Amon season this time, Bangladesh is uh, procuring rice from the, directly from the uh, producers, farmers. To, there is a uh, tendency to shift from uh, the laborer or the farmers from the non farm to non-farm activities. The subsistence agriculture, we have, uh, the, with the transition of subsistence agriculture to the commercial agriculture, now we are facing the shortage of labor in the agriculture sector. And for this reason, we need some sort of mechanization, and government is trying to give incentive to the farmers. They, this time, this year, we are procuring almond berry directly from the farmers to give price support and to incentive to the farmers. And more than 0.6 million tons of uh, berry this year we are going to procure from the farmers. And the purpose of this procurement is that the, the almond berry, there is uh, the quality of the of this rice and berry is better than boro season. And so this berry or rice has more, uh, be less liable to, to destroy or to damage by any other means. Minister, our, uh, if we consider the food as a uh, not only the cereals are included in this, uh, we are now trying to include other items like uh, dairy products, uh, poultry, fisheries, but the Ministry of Food is concerned with only the food grains and the cereals. So we need to change our policy. The new food and nutrition policy is uh, the process and we hope that, that this policy will uh, encompass the other areas also. And for this, to develop a comprehensive policy, we need some sorts of uh, research findings so that the, this will uh, help us to formulate a comprehensive policy, an effective policy. These are all common words. Uh, our public food grain uh, distribution system was developed in the early uh, 50s, uh, 40s, and then it was uh, the food system. This system was developed to face any source of natural calamities like famine, drought, uh, flood, this type. And still, we are procuring food items to stable the price to also we have to balance between the farmer's aspiration and also the consumer. When they needed the prices go up, the government go to, for the open market sale and there are sentinel programs are there to protect the distressed or ultra poor people. Uh, I have 
already mentioned that the safety net program like uh, I want to mention the 3ZD vulnerable group development project uh, program uh, vulnerable group feeding is a temporary program when the price go up or especially in the when there's no uh, employment opportunity in the, the field level the vulnerable group feeding was there and the 3ZD is around the year program Uh, in the public sector, we had uh, we have that loss of the post harvest loss is less than one percent, but in the private sector, this loss is more. So we are this is a big challenge to reduce the loss of the private <coughs> sector. Government is working on it. We have developed uh, some silos, paddy silos, and rice silos. Uh, with the help of JICA, we have established a warehouse uh, in area has a capacity of 25,000 metric ton. It's a modern facilities are there. And the another modern food, uh, food storage project is underway. This project has a three big silos, steel silos. And last year, the, from the another project, we have distributed, uh, we have distributed some uh, household silos to 500,000 uh, households. So probably my uh, time is over, but we need some source of IFRI is try, uh, helping us uh, to formulate our policy and I think that this forum is also be helpful to have some uh, suggestions which we can use to develop our uh, strategy, our uh, to, to uh, reach the targets of his disease. Thank you so much for passion here. Thank you, Dr. Mahmood, for excellent presentation and sharing your experiences from Bangladesh, from food loss to some of the experiments which we are doing. Thank you so much. Now I request Dr. Anil Kumar Jha uh, from uh, Ministry of Agriculture Bihar. He is going to present a case study from uh, Bihar, the Government of Bihar initiatives to reduce uh, post-harvest losses. Dr. Singh, Dr. Jha, please. Honorable uh, Chairman, sir, I expected uh, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to just uh, thank uh, Mr. Prashant Kalataji, who said, just said in the start of this session that close your eyes and try to look the world which you may would like to see and which you do not frequently see. And when I closed my eyes, I could see the rat picker children who I teach on Sundays. And they come to me at 11 and without any food. So that is the situation, that is the world. Among the several worlds we live in, and what we talk today, producing more, saving more food, in fact, it is more important for those people who really come to their teachers, their schools without any food. And it is very important for them. I will talk more about what we have done in our state uh, for agriculture in general and on the storage in particular. I think I, I would like movement of uh, help for movement of my slide. Can I move from there? Roadmap is major policy uh, policy document for us in our state in Bihar, and uh, since 2008 we have three versions of the agriculture roadmap. The first version was uh, from 2008 to 2012, 
and this agriculture roadmap was more on the production uh, production related issues addressing the issues of more production so three departments collaborated the department of agriculture department of animal hunt husbandry and the department of cooperatives so three department came together and made a plan and executed it and the execution was such successful that it inspired the government that we will have to uh, more holistically think about agriculture and then nine more departments came and nine more departments came and, and all those nine more departments and including the agriculture animal husbandry and the cooperatives meet all the infrastructure departments came together to help agriculture production and in third edition of agriculture roadmap the issues of the climate change the sustainability infrastructure and production all three become equally important so i just uh, point out that what we have done the average of the four years between 4 to 8 the food grain production was about 98 lakh metric ton 9.8 million metric ton and uh, which almost increased to uh, 70% now we are producing 167 lakh metric ton uh, per annum food grains and more than this uh, the 2.25 times fruits and vegetables than this uh, food grain production so this was a great uh, achievement of last decade uh, the, the decade we have worked through this agriculture road map and when we we were increasing this production the deficiency deficiency on the different aspects of the agriculture was becoming more and more apparent and when this became apparent so see what was the food grain capacity available uh, in the year 2012 when we started with this uh, second version of the agriculture road map it was merely 10 lakh metric ton food grain storage capacity in the state so we uh, we worked on this we worked on this through our state agencies to the government of india agencies and now we stand at uh, 34.45 lakh metric ton because this was one, one through uh, through which we can uh, really really save the grains through the institutional methods the storage capacity through institutions that the institutional more more than that that the institutional level what is uh, what you are able to store uh, save the grains more important is for the small holders agriculture in bihar we have 91% of all farmers belonging to small and marginal farmers so we had a challenge to replace all those mud godowns by this godown the metallic godowns metal beans and we have uh, see uh, about 3 uh, lakh numbers of metallic bean have been given to the farmers in those uh, last 10 years and we have we are also encouraging the small storage godowns at the village level and we are providing 50% help to the farmer and it is it has again been very well grounded in this state in this year we have made an initiative of this uh, hermetic safe grain bags but there are issues there are issues because we are this is the first year we are uh, we are promoting it in a big way so uh, we are trying to as uh, uh, nand kumar saab said that we have to win farmers in the beginning we have to create the successful farmers in the beginning and in this particular year we we are in this phase but the farmers who have taken this technology are very very encouraged inspired to take this technology and th i think this is the promise at the farmers uh, farmers level in the perishable sector we have we are also because i said our project uh, production is very much scattered is uh, so we are trying to cluster it we have, we have a uh, district wise focused crop development plan being implemented and we are giving because the uh, the capital uh, capital deficiency at the basic level we are giving 90% support 
for the uh, for the creation of this back house, which will be inclusive of the collection, washing, grading, sorting, and all those facility of five empty capacity at the village level. We are also providing 50% help for five metric ton capacity solar cold storage, and this is again picking up in the uh, in the state. We have a uh, we have uh, had a uh, policy of entrepreneurial development and the agri business through agri business center. This was very well grounded and this was phased out in 2017, but with, with, with another scheme, but this scheme again picked up very well. We had some 53 rural agri business centers, which, which provides all these services, including the warehouse services. Okay. And we have this, uh, the, 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 this policy has replaced and we have put this uh, warehouse and the food processing sector in this uh, the priority sector and this priority sector has to have all this concession of interest subvention, the, the stamp duty reimbursement, the land conversion uh, reimbursement, all this facility for uh, as, as the priority sector for the state and gets the additional benefit. And this is simply the uh, what has happened in the, uh, in the through the implementation of this uh, program. But more of uh, more of showing what has happened uh, of the different policies that we have implemented uh, is the the season or the climatic situation that we have. We harvest maize in the month of May, and the following two months are the rainy months. So we have to store them, keep them safe. So I was reading the paper, one paper we have, you have circulated, it was very promising. If we can save through technologies our rice, if we can save through te our technologies our mage. So mage we are producing, we are a leading producer of mage which comes in the month of May. We have to save it and the technology if you can offer to me, it, be, it would be nothing like that. And this is also the challenge and the opportunity for us to save whatever uh, rice we produce and we are we are increasing everywhere in the KT, in the state KT of the production. Uh, and, and this is what I had to say. Thank you very much. Impressive to note that uh, Bihar has in, increased the storage capacity three times in, you know, in only seven years. So this is very, very impressive. I compliment you and the government for such an initiative. Thank you very much. Now I invite Dr. R. K. Singh, uh, Director of Central Institute of Post Harvest Engineering and Technology, uh, to talk on post harvest unit operation management to reduce losses. Dr. Singh, please. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, all dignitaries on the dais and off the dais. Here I want to share my some of the view regarding study which we have conducted at the CFED. On the onset, I would like to say that uh, agriculture is most important, but it is least preferred. Given the choice, all the agriculturists may leave their profession and join some other professions. At the same time, if you visualize, milk is the most perishable item. But you see how much losses it is incurring? Almost negligible. And the grain is not so much perishable but we are increasing the losses. So problem is not the technology. Problem is the management. Honest management. What we have produced with so much labor, so much inputs, and we are letting it to go like waste. So it's a great loss to the person who has toiled hard in the field 
and great loss to the nation. At one point of time, we are having surplus production. At the same time, in the same country, people are going hungry to the bait. So, problem of PDS, public distribution system also exists. Here I would like to say, share some of the data here of the Indian food grain productions, 284 million tons. At the time of independence, we were only 55 MMT. Now, the problem is not the scanty, the problem is the plenty. So we have to learn how to handle it. Many people are talking that the data of the CFED are not depicting the clear picture. It is very less as compared to the other agencies which has forecasted the loss data. But here we have taken quantitative losses. If you take the qualitative losses, figure will be more. And the figure which are being depicted, more or less it is contributed by the fruits and vegetable. And the fruits and vegetable losses are more because the processing level is very less. Only less than 10% what we produce is processed. So lack of infra infrastructure in processing sector is one of the major reason and another reason is that our food habits we want farm fresh sir we want farm fresh we don't want processed now with the change of the lifestyle in our country husband wife both are working now we are inclining towards the processed food and hopefully it will be losses will be reduced in that way In the case of cereals, you see the minimum loss 4% and the maximum is 6%. It means our loss is dwindling between 4 to 6%. And if you say oil seed, pulses, maximum is the fruits and vegetables. And that too, 16% in case of guava. So that is the figure. And uh, I think uh, MOFPI are coming up with one study in future, uh, within very shortly it will come up. Post harvest losses particularly if you visualize in case of wheat, so harvesting, collection, threshing, winnowing, drying, so all unit operations and all together if you combine it, it is almost 5% only. The shattering loss is the beyond control of the farmers because when you are using machines or because of vagaries of the weather, you are not able to harvest at the proper time. And once it is collect, brought to the threshing floor, now entire family is taking care, taking care of the grains. That is the because it's a hard earned money. Twelve rupees per kg is the cost of production and what is the MSP 19 rupees 19 point something for per kg so losing 12 rupees per kg is a great loss and then here are some of the picture I have uh, data and uh, so around 94,000 crore we are losing that is the thing and if you get, see the grain storage scenario around 65 percent of the produce it is stored by farmers for their own consumption and at the same time our government is giving subsidized ration to the ppl families i would like to emphasize here that Giving ration to the BPL family after every 15 days or every month, why don't you give it to for the whole year? They will take care of 
that produce better than the government. So this may be the one of the suggestions. And then we are lacking, in fact, uh, our capacity of the storage. And there is a many government schemes <coughs> like PEG, like PPP mode for the vertical silo. But even then, the pace of creation of the infrastructure is not picking up. Though it is moving in the right direction, but the pace is not much satisfactory. Some of the silo capacity, still we are 1.18 million metric ton, which is very, very less. And from the horizontal back, we want to shift to the bulky storage in vertical side. And if you talk about the good agricultural practices, then from grower to handling and storage, and then good practice for post-harvest management. So this line, actually, if you visualize, there are so many fragmented genes, and their loss occurs because everything is not under control. Once it is out of from the farm of the farmers, then it goes into hands of many, many middlemen. And as our earlier one of the speaker told, that whatever loss is incurring up to the table of the consumer, it is thrown on the shoulder of the farmers. So the middlemen, they are not taking much care of those produce because it is not their being. And there are some other suggestions how to reduce the losses. If you harvesting, the farmers need to be sensitized to how to please harvest at the right time. And the right capacity of the machinery you should use. It is not that key over capacity. You are having this small farm area and you are using combine, it will contribute to the losses. And the drying. Drying is one of the most important thing. If you dry, say, up to 8%, over dry, you are losing 2%, uh, uh, 3%. And you, if you are drying less, then you are losing due to losses. So drying is the one of the most important things. And these sort of unit operation machinery things to be installed in the production catchment itself. Okay, I would like to use. Uh, then, uh, for good storage, earlier we were seeing in our house the mud or in the straw it was dumped, covered with another layer of straw. Now, most of the family are having <coughs> metal silos. They are metal, not silo, bin, provided by government, or they themselves are able to now purchase it. So now old traditional things are now gone. But training should be conducted, our sensitization is to be made, ki fumigation, aerations, and if some hot spots are developed, how to take it out. So these things needs to be farmers needs to be trained on that line. So uh, so some of the study we have conducted that I want to show in a very short. Uh, fast fuel we are using for the fumigation. At the same time, methyl bromide is also used. Methyl bromide is causing ozone layer depletion. And fast fuel, the single things we are using repeatedly, so it is resistant may be developed. So why not to use CO2? So that way we have to, uh, we have experimented it and we found out that if you use, these are the concentrations, 15% concentration if you use for 24 hour, 100% water we are getting. And uh, one another thing, uh, we are using uh, microwave assisted disinfestation of rice and wheat. And we have seen preliminary result. So these are the rice, we will red flower beetle, 
and flat grain beater for the rice and for the wheat, these three were targeted and we found that these are the setup of our experiment and then we thought if you are exposing to the microwave, we are getting 100% 60 seconds, 50 seconds for that. So these kind of things are also coming up and uh, instead of fast feed, methyl bromide, we have to use this alternative method. So, okay. so thank you very much. I want to congratulate and grateful to the organizer to invite me on this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for the wonderful presentation. So, one big point we need to raise is not, uh, technology is not that important than management. It is a very important we should keep in mind. So, friends, the, uh, the four presentations were excellent. Uh, they have given the one in the global perspective and two presentations were from country, India and as well as uh, Bangladesh. And third was on a from specific state in India. So we can see how uh, total process and initiatives and different uh, technological and management options in So now these four presentations are open for uh, discussion. Your suggestions, comments, questions. I was curious to know uh, uh, in Bangladesh why private sector losses were about to be greater than the public sector losses. I know you said you were going to do a study on this, but do you have any thoughts at the moment why that should be the case? <clears throat> Thank you. We'll collect the questions and then request the panelists to respond to those questions. My question is uh, somewhat clarificatory in nature. Uh, Dr. R.K. Singh uh, said that 65% uh, of the grain being held by farmers, 65% of the grain production is being held stored by farmers. Is that correct? Yeah. Held by the farmers for their own production. You know, because at an all India level, the picture that we get, you will uh, have it from statistics at a glance, the marketed surplus of grains is about 70%, 65 to 70%. So I wanted to be sure which way, you know, the macro picture that we have in mind is exactly the opposite of what you're saying. So I wanted to be sure whether. But the other part is that uh, you said you are capturing only the quantity losses, not the quality losses. How much, any idea you would have if, uh, you know, quality also you have to take care and convert that into it. Because I'm trying to compare it with what Bangladesh study is talking and where we are. And that's a question for Shahid. Uh, potatoes, uh, Bangladesh study is showing 24% losses. Is that right? Uh, there was a study done by Bartman and Tom Reardon right here in Ifri Corridors, which showed uh, they took Agra as the center of place for uh, story. If my recollection of uh, 15 years back or years back is, uh, it was about 6%. And that was a surprise to us. Because he said there is hardly any loss in India, very little loss. So are we comparing apples with apples or not? Or is there definitional works of uh, on the farm, after the farm, or what is happening? I think we need some granular grip on the situation. Thank you. I can respond later. Thank you. Hello. Um, Dr. Ake Singh, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I represent Grain Pro, uh, Grain, Pro uh, Grain Pro US and uh, would be interested to know, I mean I was fascinated to learn that uh, in 24 hours by uh, purging CO2, 100% uh, mortality in uh, insect killing will be achieved. It's, it would be wonderful to learn. Uh, one point which I really doubt you stressed upon drying because as per my uh, uh, understanding, drying plays a vital role and uh, there is not 
that much focus on drying, whereas we are trying to preserve the grain storage. So I would love to hear about uh, CO2 experiment. Thank you so much. Sir, my name is Divi Malla. Use the mic. My question is uh, that uh, would any anybody any data is available about the cost benefit analysis in the bulk handling of grain vis a vis the as we have been doing in the country in the two bags or such type of bags here. And then at the multi level also, what steps have been taken by the government to have a bulk storage or bulk handling at that? Thank you. <coughs> As you actually mentioned that carbon dioxide fumigation, so what uh, uh, sorts of storage structure uh, you are taking? I know the grain pro people are there. They have this grain cocoon, even it is hermetic, but there is a suggestion of carbon dioxide fumigation. But you are actually mentioning some of the metal, small metal silos uh, uh, at the farmers level. So when it, how it works the fumigation? Is it a yard type or the hermetic. If it is not, then what happens if the moisture actually absorbs later on? So whether there is a possibility of the insect infestation. Thank you. A lot of talk is on technology. I was wondering, technology is a broad term. So what type of specific technology is there? What's the role of information technology? Because I come from that background, so wanted to know from the panel what's the thought process. Thank you. Last question. Uh, I would only like to flag the issue of the copper metal, which, uh, among other things, has been one of the major export constraints. Because the not only the grain, but anything that is further processed and uh, exported, the copper metal has been a major, major concerns. And that is something we have to, when we are looking from the perspectives of internal consumption versus export of which the, uh, you know, you are aware of the quantum of Basmati rice itself that is exported, number one. Number two is, whenever there is an extensive insect infestation, there is also an accumulation of uric acid in the, uh, whatever is the, because of the excretory excretion and the contamination that takes place. These are very critical issues when we take these things further into the, uh, you know, public distribution system, and in certain cases also beyond a point whether it is fit for even consumption of the animals or making it into. The thing that really concerns me is anything that is processed is a second or a third grade product because you really don't really uh, see the full grain. But what happens is the substandard floor that goes into the uh, food chain. So these are all some things which have got a, uh, you know, a partial conversion of the crop loss into a processed food, but at the same time, the processed food also has got certain aspects which pertains to the health of down the chain. So these are certain aspects which need to be considered. Thank you. So I request to talk to the very briefly. Okay. I'd like to answer very formality, sir. Uh, what I told is the range is given 60 to 70. I took a figure 70, 65 percent held by the farmers, and it's not purely for the consumption because they don't want to give it to the government because they want some cash money. So they trade, give it to the some uh, local traders also on their own. So for the MSP giving to the government is the 35 percent, and 65 percent they are keeping for their consumption as well as selling it to the local trader to get the cash immediately. So it is held by them, that is one thing sir. And regarding other thing, uh, hermetic, it's hermetic sir, it's a seal and the uh, uh, bin is of acrylic. What we experimented is what acrylic bin and from the bottom side the CO2 is fumigated and then uh, at the head space we are taking the things and uh, concentration and other things. It's totally airtight, sir. It's totally airtight. And uh, regarding uh, drying things, uh, I would like to say sun drying is one thing. Uh, we are also having experiments and design the poly house dryers also. So, because we know poly house, if you make it, temperature will increase. 
this. So only thing, one turbo kind of things we have to fit for the taking out the evaporated uh, moisture and then it will, it will be very, very good to the farmers. And it's very easy to construct and it will be a long lasting thing. Uh, sir, Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, you can discuss during the time. <laughs> Today's I, I uh, try to make a point that when we take a technology, probably uh, when I was talking about the hermetic storage, so farmer's information is very important. And farmer, farmer has to be uh, adequately trained to take new things because they say, why should I invest 100 rupees for a polythene bag? So say, for them, it is simply a polythene bag. So this is what, where the IT is very important. And at the why this turnaround has happened in case of the creation of a storage capacity in Bihar, we have opened through a policy of the government that the APMC market yards will be utilized for the creation of food grade storage capacity. And much of the capacity which has been created by the state food corporation has come up in the erstwhile APMC market yards itself. Thank you. First one, the why the private sector losses or the private sector. You know the private public sector has a own management system which is better than the private sector. It is the one cause and the <coughs> private sector is uh, due to some ignorance, some other factors are there, especially in the rainy season. Sometimes they uh, fail to protect their uh, producers and for handling, transportation and other demand in the marketing channel, they have lost. Their, uh, the percentage loss is more than the public sector. Uh, in the public sector, we strictly maintain the, the moisture. In the storage, we normally use below 14 percent, but the farmers cannot uh, enforce this 14 or 15 or 20, uh, 17 or 18 percent. This has an impact. The other things which I want to mention that the uh, they are guided by the prices of and they invest in that way. They try to harvest their products earlier, immature harvest, especially the potato, onion, this type of thing. We have seen that they want to catch the new markets, the new price, and the storage capacity of these producers <coughs> less than the mature one. <coughs> and for this, when the consumer rather purchases from the market, they cannot store this, and the loss is here is more than the mature one. Information technology, we are introducing information technology. This time, we have introduced apps to purchase from the direct from the farmers. Those who are interested, they can uh, they can uh, show their interest through app. We want to eliminate the intermediaries. Those who are not at all adding any values, but they are taking some benefit from the channel. And apps is very helpful for us. And information technology is also we are in process. And also we have a project to implement the other areas also. Thank you. So that's a there is a huge role now information technology in, in the entire food security in whole environmental management uh, post harvest losses. You know, as was mentioned by by Dr. Mahmoud, you know, in the market information about you know about 
where farmers can get immediate in a better price and all in the research. I think our group when they did that in Africa or so the farmers would like to sell their products within seven months. You know, so it's kind of a, a rule of thumb. But uh, so that that is a huge opportunity for information technology. I let me give you three specific examples that we work with. You know. <clears throat> so our there is there are now student groups, even undergraduate students are developing apps and giving it to the grocery store manager. So the grocery store manager, if they scan their food, he'll tell you that this can of food is going to expire in three days. So immediately, that information, the software is built into that, and that information goes into the local food <coughs> banks or the communities where they need food, you know. So those, those products are automatically scaled out, that goes into a basket, and then the local people pick up. So the one of our crop science and uh, electrical engineering, two students, they develop a startup in a very decent. Another one is in the grain washer uh, in big silos, uh, moisture monitoring. So, you know, the, if the big silos, the moisture content could be different at, at different part of the, the whole container. So they are automatically monitoring the moisture content and is informing the the, the, the owners or, or other people about you know where there are possible bug infestation is going to happen, moisture content and all of that. The very third one, you know, is it's we have done some experiments on. Now people are using that in sensing the moisture content before the harvest, as as Dr. Singh mentioned. You know, moisture content before harvesting is very important, shattering losses and things like that. So uh, we have uh, our experiments show that. You know, harvesting in the right moisture content. In China, we work with 900 farmers. Uh, the wheat losses have been reduced from 6.5% to 1.5%. 5% of several billion tons is several billion tons. So now, think about the implications of information technology. If, you can, if we can give that information in a regional basis or in a, in a district level basis to the farmers, why to harvest, why not to harvest, the weather information and all of that. So there, is, there are a lot of opportunities for information technology in the entire food security. Thank you very much. Now uh, we conclude this session. We have excellent presentations and good uh, discussion. Uh, I have jotted down five broad areas which you know we can conclude from this session. Uh, the presentations were at three levels, global perspective, country perspective, as well as the uh, state level perspective. So in all the presentations, it was very clear that we are in a paradox, whether at a global level or state level or country level, that we have huge losses and waste on the one hand. And on the other, the millions of poor are living under abject poverty. They are food insecure, they are underpriced. So I think we have to reduce losses to meet the requirement of poor people. This is one. Second, that we need to systematically do studies to uh, quantify the losses. I have seen only study very systematically conducted by uh, uh, that uh, quantifying the uh, losses at various stages. That, well, I think it will be a big project, by four or five years, big project under NAIP. And very systematic analysis was done. Uh, MFPI. So uh, the losses, not only at uh, the, the quantity, but we also need to uh, measure the quality losses, the nutritional losses, the value losses, as well as the resources. You know, we are using huge resources, inputs we are using, energy we are using, the water we are using to produce that, and that is also indirectly lost. So land is also lost. So, in, uh, so we need to see that how we can minimize and uh, these, these losses. So uh, then. Uh, what uh, role of management, as Dr. Singh mentioned, and the role of ICT will play important role in minimizing these uh, losses at a least at a least cost. I think that need to be uh, developed and need to be propagated. And uh, important issue is that how to engage uh, private sector in, in creating infrastructure. So we need to document what are the constraints from the uh, private sector. Uh, the, the recent budget government of India has now come out with some viability gap uh, for you know, having these uh, stories. I don't know how far it will be successful. This private sector can give their opinion in this uh, direction. 
So with this, uh, I conclude this uh, this session. I would like to express my sincere thanks to organizers, Mr. Dr. Rashid, and to ADMI for giving me this wonderful opportunity. It was a great learning for uh, me on uh, securing the harvest. Thank you very much, and I leave it to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Joshi for uh, chairing and coordinating this very interesting and enlightening session. Uh, to present the token of appreciation, may I invite Ms. Sarah from ADMI to kindly felicitate Dr. Joshi. <coughs> and Dr. Joshi, could I kindly ask you to felicitate the other panelists?